Beyond Science, Conversations with Arthur M. Young. Interviewer Charles Svauber discusses issues of science and consciousness with Arthur Young, honored inventor of the Bell helicopter, philosopher, and author of The Reflexive Universe. Today, Beyond Darwinism, a new look at the question of human evolution. Hello, Arthur. Would you begin today by telling us what you feel about Darwin's theories of evolution? Well, it seems to me a lot of uh, hot air or something or other that's just satisfying uh, explanation without making an explanation. Uh, it's the Darwin theory is what's called a tautology. It says that uh, survival of the fittest. Well, how do you define the fittest? Well, those are the ones that survive. survive. And yes. how do you define survival? Well, those are the ones that are fit. Yeah. So it's just uh, what's called a tautology. Or, but uh, as Waddington said, he's a prominent biologist, died recently. I see. Uh, yes, it is a tautology, but it has wonderful explanatory power. <laughs> I can't conceive how he let that uh, boo-boo out, but that <laughs> that's really is the way it's taken. People, you know, these nature uh, scenes you've had on TV, wonderful pictures, and they're always mm -hmm. saying, of course, this is for survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a chorus that they keep repeating. A chorus in the background. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now let's see what does the survival of the fittest, what does that contribute? Of course, it was a contribution because it helped get people thinking about evolution. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it also stopped them from thinking. In other words, they didn't think through it. Darwin's called, called his theory the, the uh, origin of species. And it was based on finding that the different uh, warblers in the South Seas had differentiated from what was apparently one stock uh, to uh, different species. Species cannot interbreed. And uh, that differentiation applied to species. But it doesn't account for how you get jumps to higher levels of organization. That's what's the real problem in evolution. Uh, to go from, say, a lizard to a bird is a fantastic leap. And it requires hundreds of different factors which are, to be sure, in their, when they're together, they, they enable the bird to fly and hence to survive. Mm -hmm. But taken singly over millions of years, they are, you might say, long-term investments which don't give any interest during the lifetime of the ver bird. A, a, a four-legged creature has an advantage over two-legged creatures, but the uh, bird has to dedicate two of his legs, I mean the would-be bird, <laughs> has to dedicate two of his legs to becoming wings. Yes. Meanwhile, he's using the benefit of those extra legs, so it's in a future investment. And it uh, takes millions of years. It took 50 million years for the horse, modern horse, to evolve. That's a long payout on right. investment. <laughs> and it probably took longer for the birds. Now, this means not only feathers and hollow bones and a different breathing system, a, t uh, a metabolism, They're, they run at higher temperature than we do. I think there could be hundreds of different changes necessary. So we can look at, at penguins as investors. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, apparently the penguins uh, retreated from uh, the flying and concentrated on good swimming. Mm -hmm. Well, 
when you talk about evolution of, of different species okay. as uh, having happened over a long period of time, how, how do you feel about uh, the theory that uh, man evolved from the ape over a long period of time? Well, uh, I find that okay. I mean, uh, there wasn't much evolution from the ape. Uh, man has uh, an ape-like body. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go through the phyla and so forth, you find uh, that man is uh, very closely related to the apes. I mean, uh, like birds are a different phylum, and uh, mammals are different from uh, amphibia. But the much narrower distinction, uh, lions are, I think, a different family <laughs> yes. from the uh, apes. But man is very closely related yeah. to the apes. I suspect but that's his body. That's his body. And his now, behavior? Uh, I, I think we all have relatives who, who seem to behave like apes at one time or another. <laughs> well, you could also say they behave like pigs or like right, lions true. or other things. You're right. Uh, see, I draw on the tradition that man is a spiritual entity who took on an ape-like body. I see. And according to those who've gone into it, I can't prove it scientifically, but the apes were bred up to the point of, be of readiness for uh, reception of human souls. And... Uh, this was part of the uh, doctrine of the fall, too, so it's in religion, that uh, the uh, monads, souls, whatever, the original human entities uh, were not on Earth. They were, if you like, in the Garden of Eden. Just hanging around waiting for an ape to walk by. Well, no, they had a long evolution uh, pre body evolution and the tradition has it that some of them didn't want to go in the bodies and this was a great tragedy for them and for the apes because the apes were brought up to be you know accept the bodies and then they were didn't get the bodies and some think that some of the apes were the result of that they were descended from these uh failures to connect. I see. Well, what, what, what tradition is this that you're This drawing? is a theosophical tradition. Okay. It's also uh, reiterated by Steiner, the anthroposophical tradition. But I think it's closer accord with the biblical account than the idea that we were ape, were actually apes. Mm -hmm. So the, the part of the species that remain apes are those who were rejected by Monads? Perhaps, or there were ape, other apes too, but yes. uh, you look at the expression. Other species of apes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do you feel then, it, it, taking the ape back, uh, from what did it evolve? Well, the apes uh, were a long period of evolution from the lemurs, which were little, All right. almost much smaller uh, things with, with hands, very, very humanoid. Uh, but they became uh, many different types of, mm -hmm. of apes. The ones that I interest me the most, of course, they're not human, but they, they look like philosophers. The orangutans. Orangutans, yes. Oh, wonderful. They're huge, yeah. 400 yeah. pounds with hair yeah. about yeah. three feet long, and they just sit in the tree and sort of munch things and think. They seem to be thinking most yes. of the time. They're very colorful. Wonderful creatures. <laughs> Arthur, could you give us some more information on the distinction between man and apes or other animals? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I, I could list a number of, of distinctions. A man walks on two feet. Uh, he has the thumb opposed to the fingers. He, he uses speech, uh, able to write. 
I can't think of them all now, but there are a whole lot of these That's distinctions. Plenty. Sure. Uh, but it doesn't really pinpoint the essential difference, uh, which is having a, a higher degree of freedom than animals. Uh, I like to put it that uh, if you look at the variety of animals, they're perfectly fascinating the way there are different functions. Uh, the bills of birds uh, adapted to very special functions, like the flamingo is for picking up little things from puddles. Mm -hmm. uh, these specialized functions, uh, woodpecker or owl or uh, elephant with his trunk or the anteater with his long tongue, uh, and of course birds with their wings and uh, horses leg drops these unnecessary fingers and amplifies the middle finger to make a hoof. But all of these are specialized functions. Man retains the generality of the original Lemurian creature with his little hands. And this is as though the uh, force of evolution or the interest of evolution had shifted from different functions to this totally different logical type, you might say. Instead of a special function, you have hands which enable you to make all these things, like the hands can make the airplane and you can fly, or it can make the automobile and you can go very fast. You can do all the things that the animals do with tools. You can extend yourself. Right. You, you, you save your precious evolution for, if you like, the, the intellectual sphere or the mental sphere. And the body, the manual work is done by the tools. Mm -hmm. Now, what I found that fascinated me was that there's the same distinction in molecules. Mm. The, the next to highest stage molecules are the proteins which perform special functions. They all have different shapes. Everything depends on their different shape. But the top molecule, the DNA, they all have exactly the same shape, the spiral double helix. And one DNA would look like another DNA. Mm -hmm. Just like, well, another analogy is you could have a tool shop with all these different tools, hammers, saws, chisels, drills, and so on. But then there's a book in the, in the tool shop, but all books have the same shape. You see, you wouldn't be able to judge the book by the shape. Whereas the animals and the tools, you judge by their, their function, by their shape. I wonder then if as man evolves and becomes more spiritual, for example, uh, the importance of his shape will diminish and we'll all look alike. <laughs> well, from the point of view of uh, the difference in there are all these differences in animals, like difference between birds and elephants. Man is a, a very similar to one another. In fact, uh, that's another question I want to get into later, that there right. hasn't been any evolution of shape of man. But let me uh, finish this uh, reference to uh, composite reference to DNA and books and so on, that the emphasis has shifted from different shapes to the content, because it's the content of the DNA with its all the information spelled out. It's the content of the book that counts. And that is a, a, a totally different kind of emphasis. So would you say then that the human evolution is, is not in the shape of man, but in his content? just right, as in the, the right. DNA, Content and he, in a sense, is maybe on a, a spiral, sort of. Now, I'm not saying it's DNA. The DNA is a metaphor for what's... Uh, uh, it's a metaphor for... Right, yes. uh, because man is still using animal DNA. Mm -hmm. And if you really examine into the, the length of the DNA, which is a good measure of its uh, amount of complexity, yes. that of plants is, is uh, 30 some plants lilies higher, 30 times longer than man. Mm -hmm. 
So there's more expanded in the evolution of lilies yes. DNA-wise I see. than there is in man. Man is not interested in the DNA. In All right, then. More specifically, of what does man's evolution consist? Well, that's the important question, and it's a very embarrassing question, <laughs> especially to man. And it's not touched on by science of evolution at all. I think it's individual evolution. So it's not the evolution of the human species I that see. counts at all. It's the evolution of the persons in the species. And they're all at different stages in this evolution. Now, I really, to cover it, I have to go into the evolution of animals uh, to some extent. Uh, that that differs from the evolution of plants in that animals are evolving a more uh, a complex, a more highly organized group, so it doesn't matter much about the DNA. It doesn't matter to the animal evolution. Uh, they're evolving this complex uh, of instincts, the group soul intelligence. Well, that's what I was about to ask you about, and, and if you could help me understand when you talk about man evolving individually, what about his group soul and his interrelated and we are our unified aspect? Well, there's no question but what man has a group soul, but the emphasis uh, now changes, and that's the distinction, between, another distinction between man and animals. That man has to, as it were, individuate to uh, rebel against the group soul. And this is one of the difficulties that man has, uh, part of the orneriness of man. He's essentially rebelling from his group soul, and this is right and proper. I mean, sociologists might like to see man like an ant colony, everybody performing exactly their functions and no questions asked and no rebellions and everything harmonizing. Well, that's fine for ants. Mm -hmm. And it would be fine for society if the point was to have so if society were the ultimate mm -hmm. objective. Mm -hmm. But that's not. Society is just a way, a theater in which man can develop his own evolution. Mm -hmm. And this has to be done by the individual person and not by some laws imposed from without. All right, so then uh, that opens the question of the individual developing both his light and his dark sides. It uh, right. begins to allow our capacity to make war on each other and eventually to destroy our whole planet. Well, that, I hate to even think <coughs> of that uh, terrible things that can happen, but it's part of uh, making, making man face his own responsibilities. So he is coming to face his ultimate right. responsibility these days. And, and if we uh, could just drift along as a happy uh, group of uh, cow-like animals all mm -hmm. eating our food and so all forth, right. this would not accomplish the purpose of... So. of the, the purpose, though, of developing the individuality and of maximizing the separation right. will find a turn. Right. Where we do all come back together and begin to co-create. Ultimately, we all come back together, yes. but we have to make our separate journeys to right. gather the This is fruit. Those are our initiations before right. we have our transformation, right. Right. In, right. in essence, or as part of our transformation. Right. Well, it's interesting that that time type of evolution, human evolution, individual evolution, is totally neglected by all the stuff you hear about evolution. And I think it's... Uh, it's becoming more and more popular, of course, these days, uh, at least among some groups of people. Well, uh, self, they talk about self-development, but I'm yes. talking about biologists and the, sci the things you go to learn in school about mm -hmm. biology, whether you should or you shouldn't Certainly. learn Darwinism, yes. when that has no bearing on the human evolution. Let me ask you this. When uh, we sort of, we ha seem to have a picture here of animals following uh, the group soul, of lower organisms doing what's programmed for them, of man beginning to do his own thing. And of course, then he has a tremendous effect upon 
the other beings in his universe. And if we consider Gaia as a breathing organism, our Earth, and all its inhabitants and plants, and man as well, as all interrelated and as one. Um, right. Can you I speak used to, to that add, phenomenon? I used, people would object when I said man's kingdom was the dominion kingdom. The, the word dominion had a bad connotations, and isn't it awful the way man should, should be trying to dominate nature? Well, dominion doesn't mean uh, putting down and suppressing. It means custodianship. A proper ruler uh, does rules to the advantage of his uh, people. Uh, dominion does not mean tyranny over nature. I'm glad you brought that through. Yeah. Well, I think we're just beginning to get the, uh, the significance of what custodianship really means. Uh, and that was what dominion truly meant. Mm -hmm. Can you be more specific? <laughs> And it would maybe with some examples of where you see man's evolution proceeding in the future in regard to his individual development, his group development, his custodial development with the earth, etc., with the planet, planetary system. Well, here I've tried to, to, to base my uh, interpretations on science. I don't agree with scientists necessarily, but I never go, I mean, I try to use their findings. Yes. Yes. And uh, in, in the answering the question you're asking, I have to go into an area that science doesn't cover at all. That's true. And there's the teachings, so you can say various teachings. Or there are various spiritual leaders, Sri Aurobindo and mm -hmm. uh, Steiner, the Theosophists, uh, Uspensky, and many, many others going, and going back in time. This is one of the reasons I draw so much on myth, that the old myths were forms of teaching man's evolution. Uh, let me see, let, uh, let me ask you to ask that question again so I can try to refocus, because it was a difficult question. I guess I asked several questions at once. And uh, your theories <clears throat> tend to to bridge hard science and esoterics. Yeah. And if, if I can get you to, in that context, maybe speculate about the future, oh, the evolution future. of man. I, I, ha I hate to try to guess what the future would be. Uh, well, can, can we, how do we assist ourselves in our accelerating our own personal evolution? Well, just do what, do, uh, use what we have to the best that we can. Right. I mean, we're all in different stages of this, but what counts is making the most of what you have. Right. And I don't know whether, how fast we can go. According to the Hindus, you can sort of skip the whole thing by just getting off the wheel of rebirth. Well, frankly, I don't agree with that. I think the wheel of rebirth is here for a purpose, and uh, we should take advantage of it. If you want to go, let's say, to the heavenly spheres and sort of take a long rest there in Nirvana, 2,000, 4,000, 10,000 years, fine, but you will probably eventually get bored with your Nirvana. Mm -hmm and want to come down and get another round of a refresher course and get some problems that you couldn't solve with your mm -hmm. nirvana. All right. Let me ask you one more question before we wind up today, Arthur. And I'm <clears throat> in certain New Age circles talk about uh, a critical mass. Uh, maybe that has something to do with group soul. Uh, co-evolving to a certain point where we will be able to turn away from separation back toward unity and 
begin to really solve uh, the issues of our own survival in, in face of nuclear disaster, for example? Well, that's a, a little different from the question of personal evolution, but yes, it's certainly it a very real question and one that's a very, uh, even in my isolation, I'm very much uh, feeling it and, and wanting it uh, because uh, I can't get any one to listen to what I'm talking about until there's a, ch a ch overall change in the group feeling. Now, you see, if you could just serve wave a wand and have everybody uh, become group-minded and, and churned around, it would do the trick. People have to do it through their own efforts somehow. All right. What I'm saying is that instead of the wand, that there becomes a critical, a, there's a sort critical of a critical mass, mass right, right, where people have reached a certain point of awareness and expansion to recognize their unity so that they do turn. Well, I don't know. I certainly hope there, that works. And, and Where do you see us in relation to that? Well, I'm, I'm noticing right at present uh, that there's an increasing interest in the kind of theoretical thing that I'm interested in. Now, yes. this is a personal thing. This is largely because they had a conference in Galveston on Bergson, and Bergson's ideas were very similar to, uh, or my ideas were quite similar to Bergson's uh, in objecting to relativity and, and science and scientific thinking. But now scientists are beginning to recognize that. So that could be this turnaround in the terms that would mean most to me. In the other, uh, other spheres like peace, uh, my wife's interested in the Inter International Peace Academy I and see. it's been moving along quietly and, and very soundly, but no mass movement until quite recently. Mm -hmm. And now there are all kinds of uh, efforts to get peace. And yes. that business of uh, critical mass is certainly uh, beginning to count. You're I mean, beginning to see, feel some evidence right. of it. And, and could change the course of the election right. and things Good. like that. Thank you very much, Arthur. I really yeah. appreciate your insights. It's been a pleasure talking with you again today.